Today we're doing the field test for the Jerry Q 24 watercolor, I'm sorry, poke tet set. And if you guys are interested in checking out the swatching video, you should definitely do that. And I'll link that right here. And this is an inexpensive half pan watercolor set from Amazon. So that's what the palette looks like assembled. But the first thing we need to do is we need to create a piece of art for this. And unfortunately, the pans don't stay super steady in here. They do want to fall out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to sketch my field test with this favorite Castell pencil. And I'm going to do that in time-lapse. As you guys saw, that took several attempts to get right. So I hope that inspires some of you who might think this comes a little too easy to artists that no, not really. Um, especially if you've been drawing all day and you have to keep drawing for your, your night job. So um, I'm going to ink this next with a waterproof ink and I'm using the Pigma FB. So I'm going to let this dry overnight and then I will erase all that graphite. So first thing we're going to do is we're gonna go ahead and do an all over wash. And we're also going to spray these colors with some water just to get them all activated. And I think I want this to seem like it's sunset. Oh, I always pick like somewhat complicated things, don't I? I just, I'm looking at that blue and that purple and I'm thinking, gee, that would make a lovely sunset. And then we've got like a nice rose pink. All right, let's, let's go for it. Let's try it guys. I believe in the us who believes in you, who believes in me. All right, so grab some of that pink and I'm gonna have to use paper towels to dab some of this up. So I'm gonna try to work pretty quick. All right, now let's grab some of that purple. And then 
Finally, we'll grab some of this blue. And it's almost a shame to dab it up, so I think I'm just going to focus on picking up what's on her face since that's purple. Of course, it's gonna end up staining the paper. It's fine. All right, and we're just gonna leave this to dry. All right, so it seems like our first layer is mostly dry. Now, I don't know about you guys, but it is starting to become fall where I live. So I'm gonna do a couple of different colors. I'm gonna grab some of this yellow ochre. Ooh, I could also grab some of this lighter brown. A lot of these colors are pre-mixed and that makes it so easy to, to think of what I want to do with them. But we're gonna start with yellow ochre. And we're gonna use a, this is a Winsor Newton Series 7. It's probably one of the nicest brushes I own. So I totally do not expect you guys to replicate that at home. However, a nice uh, size four-ish round with a natural hair, something that can pull a good point is really helpful for grass. And I paint a lot of it when doing seven inch Kara. So I think you can trust me on my grass painting advice. So far, these paints are handling pretty good, or pretty well, I should say. But we are also just sort of one layer directly from the palette, and that makes a difference. It's not hard to do well when you're just doing one layer. All right, so we're gonna grab some of this light brown. And here and there, we're just going to, and see this is already kind of chalky, because I was hoping we'd get these really nice blooms where it influences the color, but that's not what's happening. That's kind of weak. That's okay. We'll grab some of this, looks like a Venetian red, and it seems like these inexpensive paints have a lot of optical brighteners in them, which, and they also handle a little soapy. Now, this set was probably like 14 bucks, so, and that's like full price on Amazon. So I'm not gonna complain too, too much. But I do, on occasion, try to review affordable supplies for you guys. All right, so I'm gonna let that dry. Go ahead and mix up, ooh, very soapy. Mix up her skin tone using the yellow ochre. And I'll grab some of this like, mm, I was hoping to give her kind of like a, a medium tone complexion. You know, I tend to do a lot of lighter toned people. Don't know if we'll be able to with these paints. Let's go ahead and swatch it. Hmm. Hmm. And this is toned paper, so I don't know. We'll see. But I'm going to let this dry. All right, guys, our first layer on the grass is dried. I'm going to pull in so you guys can get a better look at what I'm doing. So I'm going to go in with a smaller brush into some of those same colors. Try to draw some sharper delineations on the grass, add a little more detail. And these are really chalky paints. So for those of you who watched my Cotman field test, you might remember that um, I was talking about how inexpensive paints, you end up using more of them quicker because they use a lot of fillers, a lot of binder, there's not a lot of pigment, so it takes more to get what you're going for. Yeah, that would be these. However, I went into these knowing these were inexpensive paints. All right, so I'm also grabbing that green, or the green, the yellowy, yellowish green. Mix it with some of the brown. Oh, maybe I should have just left it. Well, just add a few green sprigs. And then 
grab some of the darker brown, which you can really see is chalky because when you add water to it, it lightens up a lot. It's one of the ways you know they're using optical brighteners. And usually browns are pretty inexpensive, so I don't know why Jerry Q is using optical brighteners even in the cheap ones, even in the cheap seats, but I guess they are. All right, actually going to try, being the optimal word here, try to blend that green out a little so it's not so like weird and doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of the piece. All right, and I'm gonna let that dry. I kinda wish I'd left it as is because it, there was like a really nice effect with like the color of the sky and then the grass. And adding the green has kind of, kind of marred that. But we're trying to figure out these paints, trying to learn how to use them. So that's part of it. And while I'm here, I'm gonna grab some of this. This is actually an orange grab some of the warmer yellow and I can zoom out so you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna go for like a nice autumn thing here and we'll go ahead and paint one of these posies at the top. Guess it'd be an anemone. Grab a little more of that yellow and get some of these at the bottom. And I don't want to paint them all the same shade because then they're going to just blend into each other. So I'm going to try to be a little more strategic than that. Also try to encourage blending, although sometimes inexpensive watercolors can be a little harder to blend. Grab a little more orange. I sort of want them to somewhat blend into each other. Then we're gonna go back into this yellow ochre and it's probably pretty dang opaque. So what I was sort of thinking is go over some of the offending grass and just sort of knock it back a little bit. We'll see how that works. All right, guys, so that's had a chance to dry. I'm gonna go on in with that skin tone mixture. Oh, it's gonna be too light. Look how light it is. I'm gonna have to mix it dark, like a lot darker. I don't know if I can though, because these, these paints are kind of weird and they have a lot of, um, seems like they have a lot of that optical brightener in them, probably like chalk. It's a very common one. So I'm gonna let this layer dry and I guess I'm just gonna try and grab a bunch of some darker browns and see if I can get it a little darker. I wonder if I painted with just straight paint on the paper, if we could get much darker than that. I don't really think so. It's a little darker, but not as intense as you would think with it being straight from the pan. All right, so some of the background is still drying. Me adding that layer did sort of, if I zoom in, you guys can probably see a little better, make it pretty muddy, which is not, not a good thing, but it is what it is. So I'm gonna grab some of this orange. I'm gonna try to layer. These watercolors do not, there's just like hardly any noticeable difference whether you're using the same color and you're trying to do a glaze or you're using a slightly darker color, it doesn't really, doesn't really build up. So that kind of makes it hard to use them like one might typically use watercolors. And then we'll try with possibly darker skin color? Nope. Oh, you can even barely tell that I'm doing another layer with these. Holy smokes. I was thinking when I swatched these, I was thinking these aren't so bad, but they're not too good either. 
at the time when I did the swatches, I was also swatching like the Cotman's I own. And I was like, oh, these are actually maybe a little bit better than the Cotman's, but no. I mean, yes, clearly I can paint with them, am painting with them, but it doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't make them necessarily, like if you're going to invest, it doesn't really make them a good investment. If you want something that's going to perform a certain task and uh, last you a while, these are probably not it either. So I kind of want, let's see, this is probably an indigo color here. That will probably work. And I can do that for her dress. And then for her hat, I want something that will contrast with the sky, but not too much. So what we're gonna do, I think, is we're gonna do the indigo on her dress first and then we'll figure out her hat. Or we have this really nice teal color that might look really nice in the grass as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and give this a chance to dry. All right, guys, so that layer that we just applied has had a chance to dry and I'm gonna tempt fate by trying to do a little bit, little bit of detail, must. No, are you serious? <laughs> I'm using the dark, I'm gonna zoom out so you guys can see. I'm using the darkest brown in the set. I mean, I could probably go darker if I mixed in black, but it's the darkest readily, readily available brown. And it like is barely showing up as you guys can see. It's awesome. So moving right on, we're gonna grab a little bit of water. Oh man, you guys should see how like milky this water looks. That's from all those optical brighteners. This will be this will be a good a good episode because we're learning about all sorts of things today. So I'm gonna water down that indigo a little bit first. And quickly do the shadow over her eyes. And I'm actually gonna grab some of that milk water. And I'm gonna attempt, attempt being the operative word here, I'm going to attempt to uh, mix a skin tone, um, like a shadow color for her skin, which is going to be interesting because we have a hard time mixing her skin, period. So. Also, if any of you guys watching this have any crummy watercolor sets at home that you want to see me review or torture me with, um, I guess you can email me. I'd really like to get a, a P.O. box set up and I'm sure I will send this set off to someone to torture them. Maybe it'll become a burn it box. After all, lightly used is allowed. All right, so I've got a very milky looking shadow color. And I want to point out because I mean, you know, despite all the problems, she's she's coming out pretty cute. She doesn't look bad. There's so many videos where, you know, one of my artistic peers will be like, see guys, you can use cheap art supplies. All you need to do is have a will to draw. And it's true, you can but it doesn't make it not frustrating. And it doesn't mean we're not using every trick we know of in order to make it work. And that's one of the reasons why I sort of recommend away from really cheap art supplies that tend to perform poorly. Because when you're just learning, you don't yet have a skill set designed to accommodate for this sort of, um, for failure. Um, so, it's kind of unfair to, you know, create a piece using every trick you know to make those materials work and then be like, see kids, you can do it too. You don't need expensive art supplies. You don't need expensive art supplies. There are plenty of good middle range, even good affordable art supplies. Um, I'm just saying that Sometimes it's a little bit disingenuous when good artists present cheap art supplies as being like, oh, you really need. And it's, it's great. It's great to learn. It's great to play around with, but it helps to know the flaws. 
like these are super chalky. So if you wanted to try certain wet into wet techniques or certain blending techniques or glazing, layering, floating techniques, none of those would really work with these watercolors. You're probably gonna get two good layers out of them and then everything else is gonna start to turn to mud. And I mean, if, if all you want are a couple of decent layers, then this might be the set for you. But if you're buying this so you can practice um, more in-depth techniques, if you're looking for like a set that can do it all, this is probably not gonna be the set for you. All right, that shadow color really desaturated her skin. So we're gonna grab our skin tone and go in again. Now, all that said, inexpensive art supplies that, you know, don't always, that have quirky, I'll say, performance. I learned a lot, and I have learned a lot doing videos like this, doing the cheap art supply challenge on my blog, uh, dealing with whatever art snacks and sketchbox sent me. I really did learn a lot. But I'd already had experience with some artist grade materials, so I had a basis of comparison. So there's definitely value in playing around with inexpensive, accessible art supplies that, you know, present a low barrier, barrier of entry price-wise, but might present unique challenges in terms of handling. There's something valuable there, but I just don't want it to be the reason any of you guys quit a medium because you use something that was not really good because you saw a video where another artist was like, oh, cheap art supplies, it's totally fine. Go for it, dude. I would just hate to see anybody give up on an entire medium based on a bad experience with an inexpensive art supply. And I know we don't all have um, access to nicer materials or we can't all afford them. And some art stores will let you try stuff out in store. A lot of the chain ones won't. I'm trying to do sh shading on those flowers up at the top and purple's a little intense. Let's try lifting a little bit of it. That helps a bit. Of course, it lifts the color as well. All right, we're gonna let that dry. So I don't know if you guys can see it, but even with light washes, we're getting sort of a gray effect over the line art. And that is just another example of optical brighteners in these paints. That's gonna be the word of this, of this particular episode video, something like that, is optical brighteners. And we're finally getting around to using that indigo, fairly watered down, here on the bodice and dress part of the dress. Kind of wish I'd use nicer watercolors because I'd really like this little illustration, but I drew this illustration for this test. So I'm going to stick it through, try to make these work for me. Learn something together using a little bit of that indigo to do a shadow on the flower basket as well. And because, you know, why not do a little bit of glaze here in the grass behind her. And of course, of course, it activates those other layers because it's cheap watercolor. What did you expect? which means it's all going to turn to mud. Anyway, I'm going to let this dry and then I'll check in with you guys and we can do another layer. All right. So you guys see all that mud down there. I'm just going to leave it. So you absolutely cannot do glazes with these watercolors. It's just not, not going to work well for you. It's going to turn into a mess. And if you like mud, that's great. Cause that's what you're going to get is you're going to get mud. So we're going to just go straight into that indigo. Man, even like working straight from the pan, it's just not, there's not a lot 
of oomph to the color. Oh, well, that's what you get when you pay like $15 and you get 24 pans. Super great deal. I'm gonna use some of that indigo. Soften that into a blend, a diffused blend. I guess I'll leave, Ooh, there we go. Do some rim lighting. So what I might do for the hair, because we're having a lot of problems with glazing in that we can't, um, what I might do is I might go ahead and paint the shadow color first and then paint on top of that. And that's something I do for darker skin tones usually because darker skin tones tend to have a lot of opaque pigments in them, or rather a lot of earth tones tend to be uh, opaque pigments. So when you're mixing darker skin tones, you tend to use a lot of the earth pigments, etc. cetera. Uh, so what I will do is rather than try to do my shadow color on top of that and risk disrupting all those lower layers, I just do the, um, I, <laughs> Shoot, I lost my train of thought. I do the shadow color first and then I glaze on top of that. And I guess I'll just go ahead and use indigo for that. Use indigo as well for cast shadows. All right, give that a chance to dry. All right, so. Gotta figure, oh yeah, now I remember what I was doing. Like how I totally forgot that for a second, even though like five minutes had passed. I'm going to just use a little bit of that same indigo for cast shadows on her skin. And I'm not gonna mess with it. I mean, you guys know I usually do a bunch of layers. I'm just not gonna mess with it any further than that because it's gonna get worse, I think. Probably can get another layer of the indigo, which really isn't an indigo. It's probably, it's probably intended to serve as an indigo, but it's really very just blue for that. I know indigos are blue, but those of you who are familiar with watercolors probably know that what I'm talking about. Like it's a little too saturated, a little too intense to really be what we would usually call an indigo. All right, then we gotta do her hair and her hat. I'm just gonna go ahead and do her hair, or her, sorry, her hat. I'm gonna try, I don't know. I kinda wanna do a purple. If I can get the purple more intense than the purple in the sky. And I'm just gonna mix it, yeah, y'all can see that. I'm gonna mix it right there. So, gonna paint that hat. And I think I've got an okay, uh, it always looks so much darker than it actually is. So this is that indigo color with purple mixed in. And it is just not as dark as I'd hoped but as I've mentioned to you guys, I don't know how dark we can actually get these watercolors. Sort of the same problem I ran into with that cotton set when I was doing the field test for that. Um, I was trying to get the background black and there was no black in the set, which is fine, but none of the, none of the colors were really dark enough. Like even the dark browns were really weak. Um, so none of the colors were dark enough for me to actually be able to get to black. All right, so I'm gonna grab some more purple and indigo. Yeah, and there is actually a black in the set. I don't necessarily want to use it. Sometimes with nicer watercolors, you can use black and it'll, if you can't, if you don't have enough dark colors, you can kind of fudge things with black and it not get too muted. But with these, I don't, man, that's like a nice color. I wish I had done her dress that color. Anyway, with nicer watercolors, you can sometimes fudge with black, but I don't 
think that's such a good idea. And I pretty much never paint blondes. So I'm gonna grab some of the yellow, zoom out, grab some of the yellow, grab some of the yellow ochre in a second. Now, given how how chalky and just sort of weak these colors are, can you imagine if we were using a water brush? A water brush adds water with every stroke. So I can only imagine how hard it would be to paint something with a water brush, especially with these watercolors. All right, so I need to let the hat dry before I can do her hair, but I can do a little bit of blush on the mouth and the cheeks. And since this is such a weak color, I'm not really super concerned. I'm gonna go ahead, blend that out a little bit. All right, and then let that dry. Okay, so um, I'm a little frustrated by how desaturated these flowers are. I am going to attempt, and I say attempt because with these watercolors, who even knows? But I'm gonna attempt to, at least in some areas, add a little more vibrancy. So honestly, with these watercolors, that's probably the best I'm gonna get. And we've got our blonde over here. And maybe I'll give her brown eyebrows. All right, so I'm gonna try for another layer of color in the hair. And we're mostly going to paint the inside core, if that makes sense. Work on that mood lighting. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a layer on the eyebrows. And I think I'm gonna go with orange to red on the feather and the band on her hat. And I might go back in and do that as well with the hair tie. And the sort of crystallization thing going on in how the, how um, the water on her dress, how that dried is interesting, but uh, I'm also kind of meh on it as well. But I'm gonna leave it alone. Mostly because I am afraid to mess with it. All right, so let's grab some indigo and some black and make these flowers into poppies. And giving that a little time to dry. And I guess I'll just be weird and give her purplish eyes. Although now that I think about it, I don't know that any of these are really very purple. All right, and let's let that have a uh, Actually, I wanna go ahead and add in that red now while it's still damp. Maybe we can get some wet into wet blending. It won't be too extreme, but it might be interesting looking. Hmm. All right, so we are nearing the finish line, which is good because I really don't know how much more I can push these particular watercolors, but hopefully this little field test has given you, you know, a feel for the Jerry Q watercolor set. I got this off of Amazon and I'm probably going to go right around and send it to someone else. Let them be slightly tortured by it. So far though, not the worst I've ever tried. Um, I did do a field test with that Artist Loft. Uh, it's like the 30 color set and the colors are in like those round little cakes. That set is truly awful. This is just a little frustrating and somewhat difficult to use. However, I can definitely see there being an audience for it. 
I'm sure hand letterers will appreciate how vibrant these colors are due to those optical brighteners. And stampers, card makers might enjoy it again because of the vibrant colors. And it's certainly a better deal than the Jane Davenport watercolor sets, at least the ones I've tried, which is the Brights palette so far. So not the best, but also not the worst. All right, so everything is almost dry and it's just about done. It really looks faded and muted. And part of that is because um, since these paints aren't really transparent, they didn't go over, they didn't go over the inks in a transparent manner. They left sort of like a residue, I guess, of the optical brighteners that were used to make them seem more intense in the palette. And then if you just build up layers of that, you're really gonna end up with something that looks, you know, a little muted, a little muddy, not as intense or vibrant as it might have looked in the store or on the internet or in the pan even. And you can try to work it and you can try to build those colors up, but as you can see in some areas, it's just gonna turn to mud so it's, you know, sort of for the best to just kind of embrace the qualities of the paint as they are and make the best of them. Now we can go over this again with ink. We can like redo the outline. We can redo the outline in places for emphasis or we can just call it a field test and make peace with uh, what it is. And I think I'm probably going to do that last option because um, I feel like the more I fight with this, the worse it's gonna get. And my experience doing these videos for you guys kind of backs that up. I am gonna use a Derwent Intense. There is a Chinese white in my set. I don't wanna use that. I'm just gonna use a Derwent Intense to intensify some of the white shadows, not too much. White shadows, what am I? Some of the white highlights, just bump them up a little bit. Try to increase the contrast. That's part of why this seems kind of muddy is there's just not really a lot of contrast. And part of that is, is that these are all kind of the same level of mud. All right, so that's gonna dry. I wanna thank you guys for hanging out with me this evening as we worked on the Jerry Q Art 24 Watercolor Pocket Set. Got this set from Amazon. I hope you guys found this field test informative. I hope you found it useful. Perhaps it has turned you on to a new product or turned you away from a product that will not work for you. All depends on how you look at it. Um, if you're interested in watercolor, I have other watercolor reviews here on this channel and I have watercolor tutorials in my watercolor playlist. If you're looking for more watercolor instruction, head on over to natosoup.blogspot.com and check out the watercolor basics section there. So I hope to see you guys again really soon. Have a great day guys. Bye.